Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. My name is Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, we're going to dig into a little bit of something that we've been talking about for a little while, uh, maybe starting a series on lost consoles. Remember when we talked about the 3DO, Mike, and how yeah. it was like... That bad. was just not very successful and mostly bad. Um, we got another one that is worse than that. Um, and it is uh, a console made by, well, it was a console made by a Bandai, um, but it was created, the, the platform was created by Apple. And it was manufactured by Mitsubishi. Don't forget that part. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> a weird part of it, too. Oh, uh, yeah. So today we are talking about the Apple Pippin. Um, we're calling it Apple Pippin because technically there's the Apple Pippin, there's the Bandai Pippin, there's the Bandai, uh, Cats Media Pippin. It's, it's weird. And so there we'll were, get into that. There were like two distinct manufacturers because Bandai made one and the, and then Cats Media made one. Apple never made one of their own, I don't think, which is strange, ah. but I guess 3DO never made one of their own either. Ah, they did make one of their own, but did I will they? tell you about that in the development okay. part. Ooh, I would love I know to hear about it. Tyler doesn't know. Okay. So. Developed by, we're doing grime facts for this console. Developed by Apple Computer, manufactured by Bandai, and um, it's well, manufactured is a weird thing to say because it's manufactured by Bandai. It was also like technically used by Cats Media, um, who had their consoles through Bandai, but but Bandai then actually the manufacturer was actually Mitsubishi. So we'll yeah, it's we'll a get, really strange supply chain of the whole of, life when we cycle. say Bandai, we do mean Bandai like of Power Rangers fan yeah. Bandai. Y- do you like Sailor Moon? Because you'll still not like the Apple Pippin. Tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the release date for each model there was the PA eight two zero zero one that was on March nineteen ninety six. Uh, the PW one zero zero one. No, 1001, and that was on October 1996. And then there's the KMP, and that's the Kmart, uh, the, um, what, what was it called? It's the Cats, Cats Media. Media. I always want to say Kmart. It's Cats Media <laughs> Pippin 2000. That was March 17th, 1997. The total number of copies sold, we only have that for the Bandai models, and that's 42,000. And we're going to tell you how that is so disappointing when I get to the Oof. development section it is a multimedia video game console as in it tried to do way too much way too early on and i would almost compare this to like what the xbox one was trying to do to your tv in a way yeah yeah like it was very similar to that except instead of going towards the route of like cable tv it was going towards the route of this is a computer in your living room that can do all this stuff but we'll talk about that more later um there are no awards accolades or groundbreaking achievements and it's for a very good reason that we'll also get to later but tyler do you want to do a little tldr yeah i could give you give you kind of the uh the set the scene here cuz it's 1996 so you know the internet is around but it's not really popular but this is apple in the 90s, and they're trying to expand their reach. And Bandai, at the time, wanted to get into this home console market, and they thought, we could make a home console based on the Mac, so they sort of joined forces with Apple. And at the time, um, Apple was also working on this, what they called uh, Apple clones, where uh, they would license out the the Mac OS software and the, the ROM to other uh, computer manufacturers that would then make Macs. So you can get, uh, uh, there's a couple of companies that made Macs in the mid-90s, um, that were not Apple. And you can still, like those computers existed and people bought them. Um, and that's what Apple was kind of trying to do in the mid nineties before Steve Jobs came back and was like, nah, we're not doing that. So there are like two pieces here to the Apple Pippin. Here's the Apple Pippin platform, which Apple developed and then they licensed it out to manufacturers. It's kind of like how VCRs all play the same VHS tapes or CD players all play the same CDs or DVDs. Uh, but there you can buy, there are lots of different manufacturers that that make DVD players and, and VCRs and CD players, right? Uh, the Philips CDI was similar to this too. Uh, the, Philips sort of developed this standard uh, called the Green Book standard for CDs that was like an interactive format. And so if you, if you built a device that could play this standard, then it was a CDI machine. Um, that... That initiative had already crashed and burned by 1996, um, and so Apple Pippin was, I guess, trying to sort of pick up that mantle in a different way. I don't know. It was designed to be an open platform that any manufacturer could license and make compatible systems for. Um, so, but we only got like two of them because the the platform itself was 
fine, but there's just there just wasn't any games, you know? So we had the Bandai Pippin, which took Apple's platform, and they built a physical product, and then there was the Cats Media Pippin as well, um, and that was made by a different company, but like, like you said, Mike, that was like also manufactured by Bandai. It, I think they took the Bandai stuff yeah. and basically made it available in Europe. I well, think that was kind of we'll the... get. They did some really weird stuff with it. Cats Media, it turns out. I found this out today. They did. They sold it, not to consumers like Bandai Pippin, but to other things that we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, essentially, it was like they were the commercial end of Cats. The okay. Cats Media Pippin was commercially selling it to companies for different uses, and I have a couple gotcha. cases of how they use that. So we'll get into that in a bit. But let's yeah. do the tech specs, which is all Tyler. Yeah. I can talk about these tech specs. So the the overarching theme here of the the tech specs of this thing was it's basically a Mac from that era. And as far as Macs go, the the specs that it had at the time versus what you could buy from Apple in a Power Macintosh, they were actually decently respectable, especially for the price. It was about six hundred dollars in nineteen ninety six money, which is like nine hundred dollars today. Um, but at the time, Macs with specs like this. Uh, slightly different, but Macs that were sort of comparable to this were like $2,000 plus, like way more. So it was actually a decent deal in terms of if you wanted it to be like a Mac, except it didn't really do that very well, which we'll get into. Um, but there were there were three models that were sort of commercially available to the public. The Bandai Pippin Atmark, which is the Japanese version. There was the Bandai Pippin At World, which is the American version. They're both at, like at mark and at world, but they are spelled differently. The at mark is at mark, and the at world is the at sign world. So they hadn't quite figured out their marketing stuff yet. Maybe they just really were like, let's talk about email. You know, we yeah. Get well, email. and in 1996, people didn't know what the at sign meant. Like now, you sort of associate it with computers, with email, with the internet, but people didn't do that in 1996. It w- it probably meant something completely different at they the called time. It the so. A world. Oh, the yeah. A world. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to those, there was the Cats Media Pippin KMP 2000. That came out in March 1997. Um, and it had a little bit higher specs in some areas, but it wasn't that much better. The now, processor? Know, the, the only other main difference between the, the at mark and the at world, by the way, is the at mark was white and the at world was black. That's, oh, the, yeah. that's the other like cosmetic difference that you can see. Yeah, yeah. The, the processor inside this thing was a 66 megahertz PowerPC 603 processor, which was... Decently comparable to lower end Power Macintoshes in the day. Uh, back in the day, they were about that that same speed. Um, you could get it in six or eight megs of combined video and system memory, uh, depending on the model. The RAM was upgradable, so it was like a, a computer in that sense. Um, eight megabytes was the minimum amount of RAM that a Power Macintosh had in it back in the day. So that may be why some of them were a little bit cheaper, was because they had less RAM in them too. Um, it had a lot of different outputs: RCA composite output for plugging into your your big fat old old timey tv crt um which output at 640 by 480 resolution um it had uh, uh, audio outputs you know the, the red and white jacks for that same purpose and then it also had a headphone jack because apple hadn't gotten rid of the headphone jack yet if that Ooh, came out apple yeah that came out now it would have a it would for sure just be a one one done jack you know you gotta do yeah you gotta it would just be your... hdmi if it came out today the headphone jack would they would they have it they wouldn't even have a headphone jack. no they wouldn't have a headphone jack They'd be like, headphones, get out of town. Yeah. Well, and it wouldn't make sense on a TV. Like, your Xbox doesn't have a headphone jack on it. Unfortunately. And I send an email every yeah. day to Microsoft. You send it straight to Bill day. Gates. I'm like, hey, Bill, I know you're going through something right now personally, but I still am bothered that my Xbox <laughs> does not have a headphone jack. He's like, I haven't worked at Microsoft in 15 years. Nice. Well, you shouldn't have given me your email, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find this email? Um. Okay, so the the Pippin had a lot of ports on it because, like I said, they couldn't quite figure out if this was a gaming machine or if it was a computer. And they kind of wanted it to be both. So it had two Apple Jacks on the front, which is just a funny name. I don't know how that's not a copyright infringement of the serial Apple Jacks. Maybe it was. Maybe they paid a licensing fee. Um, mm. the, the connector is uh, different from Apple's ADB port, which is what they were using to hook up c- keyboards and mice at that time. Um, it was it was the same electrically, I think, but the connector was different. The connector was actually the same connector used on the Game Gear for linking Game really? Gears together. Yeah. Um, don't plug them into each other because they are not electrically compatible and one of them will fry. Uh, oh, probably the Game Gear. So don't do that. Um, 
It also had two high-speed serial ports. One of them was a modem port because the thing did come with a modem in the box. So they were a little bit forward-thinking. They really wanted this to be an internet machine. And it also had a printer port because why wouldn't you want to print things from your game console? I don't know. (laughs) I always um, think to myself, if I could only print that screenshot of Apex Legends I just played, you know, yeah. every day. Yeah, on your, like, the two printers that were compatible with it, like Apple printers. Gosh, can we just all agree that printers are the worst as oh, far gosh. as, like, peripherals go? It's They've the worst They've been around for, like, 50 years, and they still don't work right. Oh, my gosh. Before, like, that's one of the biggest things that, like, um, I'm having a hard time, like, I mean, obviously not really the, a big thing, but a minor inconvenience for me of the pandemic is I hate printers so much that I always print at the library because it's free for like the first 25 pages or whatever where I live. Yeah. And it's like the pandemic shut that down. I'm like, well, I guess I'm not printing anything for like a year and a half. <laughs> like I'm just <laughs> over with that because I would never want to own a printer. I never want to own one. Oh, gosh, they're garbage. And they're so expensive. It's just, yeah. Uh, and the ink cartridge replacement. Yeah. It's just like, get out of town. Okay. Codex, a history of... Printer gripes with my yeah, print, printer gripes. That's our new special series. It's just me complaining about different printers I had throughout my entire life. Yeah, um, there was one more port on on this device, uh, an external SCSI port for hooking up a hard drive or a, a magneto optical drive, um, which is a very cool name for an optical drive. It is a very optical. cool name. That one was only available on the higher end Cats model later on, so Bandai didn't have that. There's also a switch on the back that would switch between. Um, uh, the VGA output, so you could hook it up to a, to a computer monitor of the day, and you could switch it to the composite output in either NTSC or PAL, which is pretty cool. So you could use it in Europe without, I mean, you probably still have to find a different power source, but um, they, were, they weren't like region locked in that sense. It also had S-Video out too, I should say. Uh, if you want a little bit higher video quality on your CRT, you can use S-Video instead of composite. Um, but yeah, so overall, this thing was like a low-end power Macintosh that sold for about 600 bucks. Uh, which, like I said, is not too bad considering Power Max back in the day were over two thousand dollars, like for the bottom end model. Um, so, so, but maybe you know, this options... was a secret good deal in the day, you know? Yeah, secret good deal. Except for you couldn't really use it for the same stuff you could use a Mac for, because it didn't have a hard drive, didn't have a floppy drive. Um, you would have had to buy a new hard drive. It would have had to be external. It was really not. So it was like part of, like looking at it on paper. You go, oh, that's a good deal, but in practicality. If you wanted to buy a Power Mac, you needed a Power Mac for Power Mac things, and you couldn't just buy a Pippin and do Power Mac things on it. Mm, just another flaw in the Apple Pippin. Yeah, because um, your only options really were, were CD when it came to, to software. Um, there were, like I said, there were some external hard drives, some Magneto optical drives um, for that SCSI port. If you had the high end Cats model, if you didn't, forget about it. You could um, use a mouse and keyboard on this though, couldn't you? Appreciate sure you, uh, you could, yeah. They had they sold adapters that would adapt ADB to Applejack on the okay. front. The the one video I watched, there was like a lot of weird accessories. Like there was a drawing tablet for it, apparently yeah. too. And like again, just all this stuff was made thinking that this would be a hit item, and it just was. Well, it just didn't know what it was for. They yeah. you know they made they made accessories and they made peripherals for it without really thinking if they would have the software to there for it and so it did a lot of things but it didn't do any of them even halfway well and so why would anybody buy this if you wanted it to do a thing there's always a better choice than a pippin yeah instead of getting the thing that does everything mediocrely then get the one thing that does it well i'm so excited to talk about this controller though because it's absolutely ridiculous (laughs) yeah it's like a strange like mouse controller hybrid boomerang yeah it looks like yeah you're right it looks like the boomerang the original uh playstation 3 controller that they showed off at like e3 2005 i think if you google boomerang ps3 controller you'll see it thankfully that never came out because it looks very uncomfortable uh, but this one sort of looks like that and it had a it had a d-pad on the left hand side that was not good it was it wasn't a good shape um it had a, a mouse like trackball in the middle that was the same trackball as the as apple used on some of their power books um it had four face buttons on the right hand side it had three other buttons on the like weirdly on the bottom of the controller. Like if you picture an Xbox controller where you would plug in the headset, you know, there were like three buttons down there, which is like kind of strange. Like how do you, are you supposed to use those in game? Like That's how do you, an interesting, press the, press the under the controller button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There were three of them. So, and then on top there were two shoulder buttons, which sort of doubled as mouse buttons, which is like kind of cool, I guess. Um, it's, it, it's kind of uh, that, that mouse trackball feels a little bit like a precursor to the PS4 PS5 like touchpad in the middle of the controller 
Um, but it looks like it, I, I've never held one before, but it looks like it would just feel terrible. It like, yeah. it reminds me of all those PC controllers that were made in the nineties, like the Sidewinder, you know what I'm talking about, Sidewinder. Oh yeah. Yeah. And they were clearly designed by people who didn't play games. Um, and I'm sure there's somebody out there who's like, no, I love my Sidewinder. So if you liked any of those garbage controllers from the nineties, like shoot us an email, let us know. How wrong why are, we're wrong yeah we want to know why we're wrong also the minute i see a trackball on anything i'm just like nope that's a whole big old glass of nope for me like not yeah interested. i guess that's the best way to control a mouse pointer if you don't have a mouse like on a surface to move it around on if you're holding the thing in your hand that's pretty good i guess it's not better than a touchpad but i guess touchpads didn't really exist in the 90s so like that was yeah kind of it. i just like for example those people i've worked with in office jobs in the past and they've had the mouse with the trackball on it. And I know some people love that. Oh that yeah. I can't get it. Gives into that. me so much anxiety just watching that happen. I don't know why. I just can't I just can't do it. Yeah. It seems like one of those things that like maybe if you put the time in to get used to it, you would could really enjoy it, but I've never been able to. I was like kind of going down a little rabbit hole. And this is a little bit really like peripheral wise. Like use like as a society we use the QWERTY keyboard setup, which was built for like typewriters. Because yeah, and it, was, it was specifically for typewriters for like some sort of mechanical reason, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, it was designed to be super inefficient because if you type too fast on a typewriter, the the thingies get all tangled up, or at least on early typewriters they did. Yeah, and now, so, now we're stuck with it, though. Because yeah, we're stuck with this truly inefficient keyboard layout. Because everyone's used to it, and everyone, yep. and no one was going to change. It just that, that blew my mind. I'm like, oh, I, I felt always so proud of myself for being able to type so fast, and I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could switch to like Dvorak layout. That's supposed to be faster if you can, you know, but you just got to relearn your whole keyboard. Yeah, see, that would drive me crazy because in the minute I would go to another QWERTY keyboard, I'd be like, what am I doing again? Yeah. <laughs> All right, you ready to hear about development history for this? Oh, yeah. So uh, my main source for this information comes from the, uh, it's a YouTuber, Wrestling With Gaming is their name. And there's a video they put out called Apple's Forgotten Video Game Console, the story of the Apple Pidden. Pip, 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 pidden? Pippin. Uh, <laughs> that video is fantastic, and they do a great job, and you should watch it. I'm using it for a resource. Let's get into it. So in the early to mid-90s, like Tyler said, Apple wasn't doing great. Uh, they were in a slump. They actually even did like digital cameras, CD players. They had a service that was a lot like America Online called eWorld. Yeah, they were throwing a lot of stuff at the walls to see what stuck because Steve Jobs left in 1985 and they were able to sort of coast on some of the stuff that he had done for a while on the Mac. And then once it started, once his influence was really not felt anymore, it just started to go off the rails. Yeah, so that's going on. So they're like, time to experiment with video game consoles. And like Tyler has said, and we've said a bunch of times, the Pippin wasn't designed for just video games. It was a multimedia computer for TV. The platform, like Tyler said, is designed to be licensed. And so this is where Bandai comes in. And if it sounds familiar to you, like the 3DO, which we talked about, or a more recent example, Steam Machines, that's because it is. Like for some reason, this business model does not work. Tyler will get into that later. But Bandai and other companies could differentiate like what kind of internal hardware they wanted inside of this console, but they would still have to follow Apple's reference because the way it kind of worked is Apple would design like very strict pieces of it, like the logic board, and then all the other hardware would be built around it by these other companies. So when Apple was showcasing the Pippin platform, they did build their own model. So this is where okay. I was, it was called the Pippin Power Player. And it was only used at trade shows to show software developers and tech companies at like how like it worked and to try to get them to license the product. And this is where Bandai gets involved. The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Gundam Sailor Moon Bandai. Uh, and it turns out Bandai had actually been in the video game industry since the 70s. I didn't really know this. Uh, they had a home oh, consoles they sold in the 70s. And in the 80s, they distributed the Arcadia home video console, which might be another lost console we can do sometime in the future uh, but fun fact bandai created for the arcadia the family fun fitness mat that technology was later bought by nintendo and that became the power pad did oh, you know that i loved the power pad yeah so it turns out if you played a lot of that uh, track and field game for nintendo you gotta thank bandai because that was the Gosh, family fun you could have like mat. eight people playing that game at once or something stupid yeah like that. it was so fun it was so cool it's such a really <laughs> cool technology that came out like way before its time i think yeah too. we could do a whole episode on the power pad probably okay so 
The way it works is in the 90s, Bandai CEO Yamashina Makoto uh, wanted to break into the video game home market again because like now we're kind of we had the crash. Now we're kind of seeing the resurgence again. Right. Nintendo's popping off Sega. They're all doing it. And mm-hmm. they saw the Apple Pippin as a gold mine because it's not just a video game console, but it's essentially, like Tyler said, a low cost Macintosh computer. So they just saw a dollar sign. So a deal was struck and Apple would create the console look, the logic board design, and then the software. And then Bandai would do literally everything else. This includes manufacturing, distribution, marketing, and selling the consoles themselves. And this is where things get even more weird because Bandai was like, hey, you know who we're going to get to manufacture all these Pippins? Mitsubishi, the car company. So they're (laughs) the ones that ended up making all of Bandai's Pippins. And in the end, Bandai invested $93 million into the creation of the Pippin and marketing. And that is some money. Spoilers, they will not get back. I wonder how the deal goes down to do to like get Mitsubishi to to manufacture. Is this like the the CEO of Bandai and the CEO of Mitsubishi like get into an elevator together on accident and like, oh, how's it going over there at Bandai? And he's like, well, you know, we're trying to find a manufacturer for this console we're trying to make. Uh, getting into video games. And the Mitsubishi guy goes, you know what? You're a friend. We we got some extra capacity here. You want you want us to 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 make those for you? And it's just like, yeah. That, that must be how it went down, like the, the Kingdom Hearts, like Square Enix, Disney thing that like the two guys got in an elevator and were like, we should make a game. It really feels like a whole like, you got chocolate in my peanut butter, you got peanut butter in my chocolate Reese's situation, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Mitsubishi's just like doing a solid for a buddy, you know, because they're in the same building or something and they've been hanging out and eating lunch together the past week. Yeah, but whereas Kingdom Hearts and Reese's peanut butter cups are delicious and wonderful... Um, yeah, I'm using those for both of those yeah. games. Uh, the Pippin was not. So <laughs> <laughs> the first console went on sale for 64,800 yen in March of 1996 in Japan. And this model was called the Bandai Pippin at Mark. And the American version was black instead of white. And it was the Pippin at World, as Tyler said before. And that retailed for $599. The main difference with the US version is it came with a six month internet subscription to something called Sinet, P S I N E T. And that was like an internet subscription that alone by itself cost $150. So you wow. did get like kind of a good deal in a way if you bought the American version of the console. You got like six months. It's the equivalent of getting an Xbox with six months of Xbox Live. <laughs> That's not bad. No, not bad at all. Um, So this is where it gets really bad, though. Bandai thought that combined unit sales for the Pippin in both the U.S. and Japan would be over 500,000 units. They ended up selling 42,000. Yeah, and that's where it all kind of fell apart. The other company, Cats Media, was getting a licensing deal with Apple, uh, but they went for like a different route with this. So while their devices were called KNP 2000s, they were still manufactured by Bandai and their business model was around putting Pippins specifically into hotel rooms in Europe. So guests okay. could access the internet. And this actually huh. was a good setup. Like they actually sold them. They didn't do as poorly as Bandai. It wasn't great, but it wasn't a complete and total failure. Other things they did is they sold them as a TV set top box used in the Italian leather company Redwalls retail stores. So if you were at a Redwall store in Italy in the mid 90s, you might have seen one of these machines on top of their televisions in the store. The other company, NetBase Consortium, is the main person they sold to. That's a Norwegian company. um, And they gave their over 55,000 subscribers to this Norwegian company. Uh, KNP 2000s to use for online shopping, trying to create what the company called, quote, the world's first online shopping mall. Oh, that's adorable. Yeah, they were trying to make a little Amazon using this little top box, set box thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Pippin died, like uh, uh, Tyler said, when Steve Jobs joined Apple and killed all Macintosh clone programs. That was like the first thing Steve Jobs did. Yeah, he was livid that they had done that. He was like, you, this is like a, you have taken my child and just given it away to everyone. Yeah. So there was like no more clone programs at all for the Mac by 1997. And that include the Pippins. So Bandai stopped all of their production of the Pippins in mid-1997. And they sold all of their remaining inventory to Daystar Digital, which from what I can tell is a company that bought them for cheap and tried to flip them for a profit. And they're just like, we could get this on the way out. Just grab them and sell them immediately. 
Yeah, and I don't know if they even sold them or not. But that's pretty much the development history of the whole thing. It didn't, it just, I mean, you know, they had high hopes and it just didn't yeah. happen. So maybe with a with a marketing push of from from Apple to sort of bring all of those together under one roof, they could have maybe made done some more, but it was just it was on the list of things to cut when Steve Jobs came back and and so they weren't even gonna give it a chance. Uh, which is too bad, but it was the right thing. The, all making those cuts was the right thing to do. He just just like cut everything in that company. Yeah, well, uh, Mac. Like when you think about it now, like people joke Mac and Apple in general. It's just their products are this like futuristic, clean look. Like you go into their ecosystem, and it's all very it's it's isolated. You know, like this mm-hmm. is the Apple ecosystem, and that was the total op. They were kind of trying to be like Windows in the mid nineties. Yeah. Like, yeah, they were because, well, they were getting their, their lunch eaten by Microsoft, who had licensed Windows out like Microsoft didn't make computers, but they the Windows ran on every single computer that wasn't a Mac, you know, sold in the 90s. And uh, my, Apple was like, why can't we do that? And you can't really blame out, them either. No, I, I'm, you know, with the, that's one of those things that like the idea wasn't a bad idea. They just didn't execute it right, you know, and maybe given more time in the clone with with clones uh, existing in the world. um, maybe they would have taken off a little a bit better you would have had some manufacturer make a one that got really popular because it was cheap and powerful the same way it they, like dell made a pc you know or maybe dell would have started selling mac stuff like that so um yeah it's uh, interesting to think about what the world might be like if steve jobs didn't come back to apple and i gotta think that it like apple wouldn't ex- wouldn't i don't know if they if they would have gone under they might have gone under but um, it'd be a very different world it, it would be it would very be... different that's right they could, I mean, I could see him being like other, like, because I mean, remember when we were like growing up, I mean, Gateway 2000 was like a yeah. big brand or um, also like Compaq or H, yeah. they would probably be just like HP or another one of those companies, you know? Yeah. That- or imagine if, if you could, when you're configuring your computer on Gateway 2000's website, you could choose Mac or Windows, you know? That's probably more. That's a bonkers world that I don't want to live yeah. in. Yeah. They mm-hmm. might have gone out of the hardware business altogether and just competed in, on software with Microsoft. Yeah, it's, it's it's really weird to think about. This whole like yeah. 90s computing history is interesting though. So, But let's yeah. get back to the Pippin That's such a, with games yeah. and software. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about the games here. There really weren't that many games released for the Pippin overall. Uh, most of them came out exclusively in Japan. Uh, there was like 80 titles total, I want to say, and most of them were... Japanese exclusives. America got a smaller amount of games, and then Europe got like nothing almost. They got like two games and a demo disc, I think. Um, the problem was there wasn't a coherent strategy from from Apple or from Bandai or for an, from any manufacturer. Um, they're just they're they just like we're throwing things out there and then not doing anything with them. Like honestly, there's just there's nothing notable to talk here. Like there's a there's a fun video on, of Linus Tech Tips. They're like playing a Gundam game for like 15 minutes, and it just looks like a game you might have played on your Mac back in the day. Um, and there's nothing really special about it. Um, the biggest thing that I think we can talk about is uh, uh, one that we talked about on the show before. The first two marathon games are on Pippin in console form, so like that's kind of neat, I guess. Um, mostly because the the software was based on Mac software so it was pretty easy to bring mac titles over to the pippin and vice versa um and actually something cool about most pippin software titles is uh you can just pop that cd in your mac and run it without any modification like you don't even need a pippin to, to run those that games is cool if you had a mac yeah also uh, I, I thought of, of a fun fact too real quick that i forgot to mention that you're maybe think about when you're talking about like how there was no coherent strategy between apple and bandai mm-hmm. um apparently and this is in that video that i referenced above but uh, Bandai was not allowed to use the term computer in their ads, and that was Apple's. Oh, probably Suge- to prevent like, like competition or something? Yeah, contractually, Bandai could not say computer because Apple was trying to sell their Macintosh computers. Bandai had to call it like a multimedia console or a home video console or something. Wow. You know? so they- Which is another reason they got kind of completely screwed over by this whole deal. Yeah, so there's like there, there's just some sort of fundamental misalignment between the people making the device where they're like, we want this to be a computer you can hook up to your TV and the people who are like marketing it saying, we don't want it to compete with our actual computers. It's like, why did you make it that way then? Like it, it very much looks like a lot of what it does is, is Mac computing stuff. Yeah. 
I think Apple just wanted to be like, hey, you know what? We're just making money on this side thing. We're, we're selling the license to it. It's super easy money grab. And we're just going to not even yeah. be. They didn't even want Apple like to be associated with it. You yeah, know? that's so strange. It is very strange. I really feel like Bandai got the really bummer end of the deal here, you know, especially yeah. with them like putting $93 million into this and then Oof. just it completely tanking. So sorry, fun fact about the disjointed yeah. nature of the strategy here. Yeah, because they're, they're like in a world where that get, pulls off correctly, like you get a big m- uh, marketing push from Apple being like, this is the future of computing. Bandai is making it. You can play your games on it. You can uh, plug it into your monitor and it's a Mac, you know, or you can surf the Internet on your TV, which is like kind of starting to get sort of popular back then. Do you remember Web TV when that was a thing? Oh, like, yeah. Microsoft made a sort of set top box similar to this that would let you go on the Internet and surf the Internet and do Internet things. Um, but so this was like kind of able to do that because it had Netscape Navigator. You could get for it, so Netscape you could like kind of go on the internet. Yeah. Oh man, I miss your Netscape Navigator. Yeah, I yeah. just I feel like it's exactly like I 100 percent agree with you. If Apple marketed this the way they heavily marketed like the iPod, like this is the yeah. future of listening to music. If you said this is the future of home computing, is having this console on your set we might actually have all been duped and we might all have like instead of having a pc at home we might have a set top box computer you know <laughs> like yeah it's just yeah. a really weird thought that because apple kind of sold the license and walked away this whole thing it became a blip that i didn't even know about until like three days ago yeah like it's i told crazy. i asked tyler i was like hey do you know about this he's like yeah it's just terrible so we haven't talked about it <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's truly awful but just it does really have bad. an interesting kind of story to go with it and and i think um like i can give you my my take on this is uh the idea was not a bad idea it was bungled in execution and i think that we can see um two separate paths that the technology industry has taken that sort of branch out from this um and, and and I'll talk about those in a second, but I think that this product is really just a result of Apple in the 90s just floundering. Like like we said, like Steve Jobs has been gone for a good 10 years by then. The company just didn't know what to do. They had a lot of issues in the early to mid 90s with their operating system because they could not get a real uh, successor to the Mac operating system going. Like um, Microsoft had come out with Windows 95 and was just like that was next level stuff for PCs back in the day and Apple really just didn't have anything to answer it with and their their operating system was slow and it was prone to crashing in ways that uh, that the competition wasn't and they had several like failed attempts um, if you look up a software project called Copland you can you, there's like this sec- this failed attempt to make a, a modern operating system that just ends up going nowhere um, and they don't they don't truly get to a new operating system until 2001 when they released Mac OS 10. Um, so the whole of the nineties was just a real bad time for Apple in general. Um, but, uh, yeah, so at this time they were like doing kind of a lot of just crazy things without a coherent strategy. And they were just hoping that something would stick. So we had things like the Mac clone initiative, uh, like which was just what Pippin was a part of. Um, the problem was that the Pippin machines were supposed to be like a hybrid, which sounded neat in the nineties. Like if you're trying to, to, to think about like, well, where's the industry going? And it's the nineties you would say, well, what if we combined a computer and a console? Because they're kind of similar already. And you would think, oh, you, you w- wouldn't be faulted for thinking that was maybe the future. Of course, looking back, we can say, what a dumb idea. Um, but at the time, it sounded pretty good. It just didn't do either of those things very well. So it wasn't a good gaming platform. The specs were not great. Um, and it didn't have support for 3D graphics, which the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 did have. The PlayStation came out a couple of years uh, earlier, then the Pippin, and then Nintendo 64 came out right around the same time. The PlayStation was half the price. The N64 was even cheaper. So if you got this to be like to get a gaming machine, you were you were uh, paying not you're paying like a lot of money for not a lot of hardware. Um, even if it does compare favorably to Power Max of the day, it was still like if you got it to play games, there were way cheaper options, cheaper and better in every single way. Um, and the game development didn't have a good strategy either. Like I said, the biggest profile game on there was Marathon, which you could already play if you owned a Mac. Um, there was like a Power Rangers Zeo game that looks I, like it might I have been kind of I saw footage of that. That looks really cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's got some yeah. cool graphics. <laughs> and I guess like that's the Bandai talking, you know. Uh, they made a Power Rangers game. But in the end, like just terrible hardware. And it had no games. Like Honestly, you can have terrible, truly awful hardware if you have games. The problem is if you have terrible, awful hardware, 
developers aren't going to want to make games for it. So they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but if you have games, even if the hardware is terrible, you can still, you can do well. Like the original Game Boy, the hardware for 1989, when the original Game Boy came out, was garbage, even in 1989. It was like the screen was terrible. Uh, it had pretty good battery life, but like overall, the, the processor was very slow. But they had games. So and many if you had games. Because think, think of like you had the Game Gear that came out that was definitely way like light years ahead in hardware. Um, the band, like I think it was Bandai that made the Wonder Swan too. I want to say so. They th- this wasn't their first like gaming hardware thing. That was better than the Game Boy too, but they just didn't have the games. That's what it comes down to. You gotta have games. Gotta have games. We said it. The, we say it once. We say it a thousand times in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, but the other half of the the Pippin, the making it a computer, like you could, if it didn't play games very well, but it was a pretty good computer for a decent price, then you could say, all right, well that's all right. But it was a terrible computer too, because you had to. It was designed to be used on a television, and computers were way past TVs at this point. They were they were designed to be used on higher res displays, even if they were still. Even if they were still 640 by 480, they, the, they were used, like, computer monitors were higher quality, you know? Um, so surfing the internet on your TV, that's hard on your eyes. Most Americans at the time really didn't want to surf the internet anyway. 1996, the internet was not great. Um, yeah, it was not great it, at all. <laughs> yeah. Like, Google didn't exist. Like, searching hardly existed. You would go to a website, and it would just be a list of other websites, and that's how you would find stuff on the internet, and it was just not a great experience for most people. Um but uh, uh, it did a little bit better in Japan, where the general public is kind of ahead of the curve in a lot of ways, especially in the 90s. Um, but in, in modern times, there are two distinct things I think we can point to as having been influenced by the Pippin, or at least trying to accomplish similar things. Uh, the first is obvious. I think I've been talking about it for years now. I've made YouTube videos on this Here subject. we go. Here we go. The was... Apple TV is Apple's gaming platform, like home console gaming platform. You can sync up a controller right now and you can download games to play on your Apple TV. And they're good too. Like Apple Arcade has a lot of good games on it. The uh, Fantasian is a game made by the person who made Final Fantasy. And it's a, it's a legitimately good JRPG. Like it's super fun. Um, and so like the Apple TV is the result of like uh, many years of refining the iOS experience and then making that into something suited for a TV that's also focused on the TV experience. Um, that's like the main purpose of buying an Apple TV these days. But I think that like Trojan horse of games is pretty cool too. I wish I'd, I'd like to see them sort of put more emphasis on that. Um, cause What's I think the they one that's take like on... the, sorry, like the Zelda game is it ocean horn, ocean horn. Yeah. And ocean horn too. Those are good. Uh, those too, are great. Right? Yeah. yeah. And they're on, they're on Apple arcade or the first, the second one is on Apple arcade. You can play it on your phone. You play it on your iPad. You play it on your TV. Um, that's, I think Apple has like a huge head start there of just being like, play your games anywhere. Just buy Apple hardware and you can play all your games anywhere. I think that's so cool. Um, but the other part of this is the uh, the, the licensed uh, software sort of like open platform kind of thing is that something that hasn't been quite as successful with, and, and you mentioned this earlier, is the Steam Machines, um, which was a software platform developed by Valve that was basically like a prepackaged operating system. It was Linux with Steam on top of it, and it was like gaming focused. Um, and the idea was that PC manufacturer would make their own hardware that runs Steam OS and it would be this like open console revolution that I guess people would buy instead of a PlayStation or an Xbox. They didn't, and they stopped selling those. But uh, th- those might be fun to cover in a future episode. I kind too. of wanted to get one just to be a part of this failed piece of history. Like after yeah. the fact, this was like well beyond the point where like okay, Steam machines are just dead. You know, because the yeah. idea was sound. Like yeah, we talk about how great PC gaming is, so we make a cheaper PC that runs this really lightweight operating system that just essentially yeah. runs Steam. It's just a PC yeah. that plays Steam only, and then put it in your living room, you're good to go. And I've heard from you that the Steam controller is not that bad. I love the Steam controller. I would even venture to say that it is good and not just not that bad. Oh, wow. Um, he, some real some real great takes from Tyler hot today. Take, I yeah. love it. And, you know, if you want to, if you want a project um, and you can find like an old computer somewhere, like you can install Steam OS on anything. It just runs on any old computer. So you could you could try that out if you wanted to, if you had an old machine lying around. You know, I'm sure I do somewhere around here. I could find one. Yeah. Um, so the last part of my my take here is is that uh, many times when a company tries to do like an open gaming standard, it ends up not working out very well. I get it why they try. Like I said before, it works for DVDs. It works for work, work for tapes in the day. It works for CDs, Blu-rays, all different forms of media. You can buy a player for that form of media that is made by a different manufacturer. There's a bunch of different manufacturers, right? But why doesn't it work with gaming? We got the CDI, the Pippin, Steam Machines. They've all failed spectacularly. And the 3DO, too. Why 
So my question to reader to readers to listeners is, why do you think that is? And please send us an email. Um, I can tell you what what I think, um, and I think it's because every time an open standard has been put forth, there's been a lack of agency on the part of either of the participant participants. So Apple never advertised the Pippin. That was on Bandai. They also never had a software strategy beyond just we'll put Mac OS on it, basically. Um, and and so like was that also supposed to be Bandai's job was to to recruit developers for this system? It probably shouldn't have been because they would be recruiting developers for their competition as well because Bandai would be in competition with other manufacturers. So it would be kind of weird for them to to like bring developers in that would potentially be selling consoles not made by them. So I don't know what Apple was thinking there. Or did they think that by having no strategy that that, that was actually any strategy, right? They keep the door open to any strategy. Um, and then they just hope that like if they built it, developers would come, I guess. Um, if that were the case, then they should have made a more gaming friendly system because developers wanted to make awesome 3D games at that time and the PlayStation N64 had the specialized hardware. That was where it was at. And they cost less than half the price. So there was a huge market of consumers to sell to as well. So Apple and Bandai got kind of the worst of both worlds here, and they only had each other to blame. Yeah, I actually um, watched some footage of games being played, and I'm be, I'm having sarcastic air quotes when I say that, um, on the Apple Pippin. And they look like poorly executed education games you'd play in a computer lab in like elementary yeah. school and that's most of them look like that you have some that aren't like gundam and the power rangers game and marathon but a grand majority of them look like just I mean they're terrible computer lab software that you'd open up as a kid in elementary school and be like this is neat and then you realize there's not a lot here and then just close it you know <laughs> yeah like you would play it because it was getting away with playing games during school but you wouldn't you weren't about to play that at home yeah and I should say it's yeah. no Oregon Trail because we all know Oregon Trail slaps. All right, that but is it, great. it was just like it, from what the things I saw, it was like weird games where you're like going on an adventure with a cast of kooky animal characters, or you're like painting something, and it's just like there was this Dragon Ball Z anime themed game. And I, when I say game, I mean you like make stickers of anime characters. It just, it didn't. Yeah, it just had nothing there. There was nothing. There and then, yeah, like you're saying, like PlayStation is just crushing it at this time. It has and games, and so is Nintendo. Like you gotta uh, have games. Yeah, yeah, no games. There's so um, many problems with this thing, but yeah, that's uh, it's a whole. It's I mean, it's a whole podcast about this. <laughs> it's not yeah, terrible. Like yep. it's a perfect storm of terrible. <laughs> yeah, I have one more take. One Ooh, one I last thing. One last parting parting gift before. Uh, we move on, I guess. But uh, I want to talk about why this model does work for things like DVDs and CDs and Blu-rays. Um, and I think it's because all of those formats are passive formats. The content is created beforehand, and that's just the medium for distributing it, right? Um, but because games are so closely intertwined with the hardware that plays them, a developer needs to know that the platform they're working on is dependable and supported, which is what Sony and Nintendo and Microsoft give to developers. You know that if you go make a game for any of these platforms that you will be supported and it will be a good platform to do that. Apple couldn't do that and Bandai couldn't do that in the 90s. And so that's why it works for those other formats and doesn't work for interactive um, like computer game program. Yeah, formats. and I will, I will say to give Apple their credit now, as you said before, the best part about Apple Arcade is it is like true games. These are not your typical yeah. phone games of like microtransactions. I'm pretty sure there's like a rule there's no microtransactions yep. in these games, the right? It's is like, no microtransactions. So that's, it's like they, they did figure this out. Granted, it took them, what's this, like almost 30 years, 25 yeah. years to get to that point. But yeah. they have figured it out and it's it's much better now. And I agree with you that I think the Apple TV is, a, and I'm actually excited about the home the whole idea of getting one because I think I will get one soon-ish here for our living room. And then I could try out some of these cool like phone games that are actually so much more because in reality yeah. phone games are so much more now they could do a lot more stuff than they could before we've gone yeah. a long ways in snake you know as much That's as right. I love snake okay yeah so yeah. what's your take do you have uh do you have a hot take on the the apple pippin on the apple pippin apple other Bandai than the fact pippin? that those games were just so trashy like i just mm -hmm. like i i honestly feel this is one of those situations where i feel like as a consumer you're taking a huge gamble thinking yeah. that this is the future and i in those 42,000 people that bought these consoles i feel like they got completely 
ripped off, you know, and, and we didn't even talk about the fact that they had the methods to do software updates on these Pippin consoles and Bandai chose not to do it. The technology Ugh. was built into this console and they stopped upgrading after a certain point because they were just like, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. We didn't sell enough. There's no point. So not yeah. only do you buy a console where it feels like the developers have already given up on you, or the console developers, not the game developers, but then they really do like give up on you very shortly afterward. <laughs> like it would be like if you bought a Microsoft console and it didn't sell well, and they're just like, well, we're moving on to the next one, you know, and it, it would feel, feel bad. It would feel really bad. So yeah, I'm curious now though, if people that bought these in the 1990s, if, if you did, own one of these or know someone who bought one of these in the 90s i would very much like to hear an email from you or talk to you yeah. hear one or read your email sure whatever um i'm curious like what the reception was like because in 1996 i was eight and i don't think i had any realization of what was going on um <laughs> but i would like to know if you did buy one of these what it was like so you can email us at codex history podcast at gmail.com uh tyler what have you been playing uh, just more Persona this week. Um, I'm still sort of cranking away at it, um, uh, but I haven't spent as much time playing playing games this week because I've been working on some other projects. So really cool um, projects that we can't tell you about. Well, yeah, they're not because they're secret, just because they're not actually that interesting. To they're not that people, related to this podcast. They're, yeah. yeah, they're completely unrelated. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, been but but having fun playing some Persona, testing out some other games on my my handheld PC. Um, I got a solid like 60% hit rate with games that like work versus games that won't even load up. I tried to load up Black Ops Cold War to see if I could play some multiplayer, oh, yeah. which I think would run okay. It just doesn't, it like gets to the, um, like to the start, like it plays some of the opening video things, you know, like the advertisements for the developer and then it just crashes. It just doesn't even attempt oh, to. So did you get the second I, one too? Didn't you say you got two in the mail? Uh, the second one doesn't come. The, oh. the second one isn't coming till like July. It's been delayed. Uh, cause I was going to say, there's yeah, a whole saga gonna, there. If you, if you haven't caught up, Lester, the plan was Tyler was going to try these two out and then return the one that was, or sell the one that was like, yeah, not probably great. sell the one that, yeah. that was not as good. It, it's really looking like the GPD win is going to, going to get sold to somebody who, who wants to play games on it in the IA Neo. Just, and it's just a, it's a driver issue with, with Intel. Um, it's not even GPD's fault. It's just that Intel's drivers are garbage and oh, they man. know about a lot of problems that they, that people have with playing games on their graphics cards and they just don't they're not fixing them which is a real bummer that's a real bummer yeah it's a bummer because it's not about power it's not like oh it just wasn't strong enough to run call of duty it's like it just there's some bug in it that won't it won't launch that's yeah, the problem. Like, it can run call of duty it's just a weird hardware bug that's a yeah yeah that sucks yeah well so, anyway what have you been playing this week i have gone headfirst back into destiny 2 why well I'm glad you asked, listener. One, because I have a problem. And two, because I am so excited. This new season just came out, and they're bringing back Vault of Glass. So I am 100% into Destiny 2 again, solely on nostalgia fuel. Like, nostalgia nice. is fueling me to go, not even that long, like seven years ago, right? Six or seven years ago, I think, is where I'm at right now. That's a while ago now. Yeah, and that's, I just want to play Vault of Glass again. And try it out. But until then, I did get to play. There's a mission called Presage in Destiny 2. And it's a really cool mission. It's essentially like if Alien Isolation and Destiny had a baby. It's very scary. It's a spooky mission. But they also have like puzzles in it. And this boss is really hard. And I soloed it like a champion nice. with the help of a YouTube video. And I sold it on normal. And I feel very proud of myself for this, <laughs> even though it's not that hard to do. <laughs> and I was way <laughs> over leveled, but still. Uh, so that was really fun. And it kind of got me excited to play Destiny again, just doing that and like having a challenge for yourself and then beating yeah. it. It just feels good, you know, even if it is like, yeah, it's a video game, but still, you know, it feels yeah. good. That's why we're all here. It's fun. Okay. I had a good I'd, time. I'd be more into playing it if I could get it to run on my handheld, but it's one of those games that just won't boot up. Yeah. See, and it's fun, and I'm, Tyler's going to get back into it with me eventually, but I, uh, I'm i a big fan of it, and I've been playing that a lot. I haven't really been playing any other games this week. It's been getting really busy around here, so I'm just trying to like finish up school, do all that stuff, and then 
get back into games because I wanted to kind of get back into and finish a backlog game I have. I have a couple options here. I have Dark Souls. I have Borderlands 3. And then I think there was like the, oh yeah, the Switch indie titles like Golf Story and stuff mm. like that. That I got Mass Effect to play too. Oh my gosh. See, there's just too many games. There's just way too many games. And I love all these games. And I really want to play Mass Effect Legendary Edition again because I never played 3. I played 1 and 2. And I just never bought three and I just missed me. I just missed it. And yeah. um, I need to play that. So it's another thing I got to play. But yeah, so I'm hoping that this week I can get a little bit more time. It's not looking like it, but we'll try. But I really quickly want to brush up on what we're doing in the next couple of weeks with the podcast here because we're doing something a little different, not too different. You've, you've had it before. OK, but next week. We're going to be talking about a genre that we have been ignoring for way too long, and I'm really excited to get into that. But a week after that, um, we're both kind of going out of town, so we're going to have a mailbag episode. So we are not doing emails this week or next week, and we really want you to email us, codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com, so we have enough material to do that mailbag episode that would be really helpful if you could do that. And we'll have that episode coming up in two weeks. But next week, we are going to talk about fighting games, finally. Yes. Specifically, the beginning history of fighting games. I'm kind of thinking I'm going to go all the way up until Street Fighter 2 because, well, we'll get to this, but there's multiple eras of fighting games. And I want to cover the first era from the very beginning. And then from that point on, I think I can actually go into individual game series, like your Street Fighters, your Tekkens, all that stuff. So, uh, Virtua Fighter, you know? So... Yeah, I'm excited, though. I'm excited to talk about fighting games. I don't have a lot of experience with it. There are so many fighting games in that first area that each bring something different to the table that I think it's a really interesting topic to talk about, and I'm very excited. But, Tyler, do you have anything else you want to mention? Listener? Am I missing anything? Any announcements? No, I think that about covers it. That about covers it. All right. Well, with that, thank you so much for listening. You want to say bye to everybody, Tyler? Yeah, bye, everybody, Tyler. <laughs>